Carson Report. Happy Monday. How's it going? Tammy, Matthew, Kyle, Heather, whatever, Carol, Wendy, Lisa Boo, Bernadette, Chris, Brandon. What, how's it going, everyone? Did anyone do anything exciting this past weekend? I went to a music festival on Friday. Uh, we were supposed to go Saturday, but I had some issues with my car. Um, so I couldn't go. Unfortunately, I got the issue, one issue taken care of. But uh wasn't able to go the second day because by the time I got out, it was my car was ready. It was late, unfortunately. So... Lisa Boo goes Project Metal Music says hi. Say hi. Say A up back for me, Lisa Boo. I understand he he lives, he's eight hours eight hours ahead of us. So I totally understand, but I appreciate that, Lisa Boo. But one part of my car is squared away, which is good. But other than that, how was your guys' weekend? I'm going to wait for people to uh, trickle in. Tyranna! What's up? Anyone see anything interesting this weekend, movie-wise? I think there's a few. I think there's a few horror movies out there. Chris, I, <clears throat> I did not go online, or I didn't uh, go live on Saturday, Saturday, so you did not miss anything. Honey, what's up, Joanne? Matthew, how's it going? Matthew, were you able to see uh, Ghostbusters? I haven't seen it yet, but I was just wondering if anyone out there has. As I wait for people to trickle in. Logical Spock, Delay of Lux. Lusk. No, Saturday I was supposed to go to a uh, music festival, but I had issues with my car and I didn't want to drive my car out there. The, the festival is about an hour from here. Actually, on Friday it took us two hours to get there because of traffic, but it's about an hour away. And no, Chris, you didn't miss me. Carol goes, we got over 20 inches of snow, got my truck stuck along with my other truck, and now one is at the dealership services department, and my son had the other, but otherwise it's a good weekend. S Glad you had an otherwise good weekend, Carol, despite the snow. That's awesome. Matthew goes, still car trouble until next month, so no, but I found $10 in the grass walking to the store. Hey, awesome. Yes, Joanne, there's a new Ghostbusters movie. Um, I believe it came out this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. D nice. New puppy is a handful. My uncle came over. I need to socialize her more. She's almost fully vaccinated and she is super cute. D nice. I've seen the pictures. Lisa Boo is glad it's getting warmer here. We had snow for four days. Awesome. Not awesome. I mean, awesome for people that like the snow. We had crazy rain. And then, too, the reason why we didn't, it wasn't just my car problems. It also, too, it was raining in the morning. So we were debating whether to go or not, too. And by the time it stopped, it was kind of late to get over there, too, as well. So, and yesterday we had some freak weather here in SoCal. It was raining, raining, hailing, pouring, thundering, lightning, crazy ass, crazy weather we're having. And I think we're having another storm come through this weekend. So we're having crazy weather this year. Matthew goes, I trust the audience before criti critics and audiences really like Frozen Empire. That is super cool. Honey2800 is excited for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I saw the tr the teaser trailer, and I thought it looked pretty cool. I'm hyped for it. D-Nice goes, I'm a multi-pop, um, 
multi pom mom now. <laughs> she is super cute. Chris found a $20 bill once at the ground at my ATM. I found, I think the most I found was, no, I found a $50 bill in Vegas and there was nobody around. So I was like, yeah, mine now. <laughs> No, there was no. D-Nice was like, no string on it, Lisa. Nope, there wasn't. It was a real $50 bill. So why not? I think that's the most I've ever found. At first, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was like a 10. And then I op I was like, <laughs> Elaine, how's it going? But that's pretty much the most I've had my luck at. But besides, Kyle goes, I'm always going to be a bit biased. The Ghostbusters, the game is the closest to the OG Ghostbusters 3 story script. Logical Spock had a retirement party for staff where I live. That's super cool. I think some people are now starting, what, spring break now? Or... Here, I think it's next week when all the schools start spring break. They start, which is weird. They're starting spring break after Easter. And I can't believe this month has flown by. When Wendy goes, I found a 20 in the grocery store. Did a look around, put my foot down, and tied my lace. I found a dollar one time at the grocery store. And I looked, I didn't see anybody. I was like, if I saw someone walking away, of course I would, would hand it to him. Carol found a 50 at a stop sign. Oh, it was your lucky day, Carol. Kyle goes, this is start of week two of March spring break. Honey, 2800 goes, the colleges are staggering their spring breaks. I know they're like all, it's weird. They're all at different times. Gene Rick, how's it going? Joanne found 80 bucks in a wad dropped by some teens running past me to get out of the rain. Had to chase them three blocks. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah, if I saw someone drop it, then of course I would, I would hand it to them. But if there's no one around, fair game. Totally fa fair game. Marloka, how's it going? All right, guys, before I was waiting for some people to come in, but before we get into the main topic, um, I have some movie news for you. And this one came from it's a it's a local news station here in SoCal. Jennifer Marie, I'm manifesting myself finding the winning Powerball ticket. I thought of getting one, but I think they sold one. They already mentioned a winner. They were like, a SoCal ticket is found as a winner. I was like, oh, too late. <laughs> so this is from a, um, the local news here, Fox 11. And it goes, new horror film earns 666-666 on Sunday's box office. That is crazy. That's why I wanted to share it. I thought it's super crazy. The weekend box office got a little fright thanks to the horror film Late Night with the Devil. The film earned a total of $2.8 million overall, taking sixth place at the box office, and coincidentally earned $6,666,666 times three on Sunday, according to Variety. So it was 666 twice. That is crazy. 
producer by IFC film produced by IFC films late night with the devil stars David dash Malshian as a fictional character show David I should pr- know his name he's o- he always pops up on uh DC films and he was even on the CW flash uh David dash Malshian as a fictional talk show host in the late 70s who plans a Halloween special like no other, unaware he's about to unleash evil into the living room rooms of America, according to the film's official website. This weekend's release of Late Night with the Devil set fire to our old opening record, Scott. Scott Schumann, head of AMC Network Films, which encompasses IFC, told Variety. It continues to showcase that there is still potential for highly reviewed, intelligent auteur films in movie theaters across all genres. Actually, this movie actually kind of sounds interesting. Late Night with the Devil will also later release on the horror stream horror streaming service on Shudder. April 19th. All right. On April 19th, I'm going to check that out because I do have Shudder. Another religious horror film, The Sydney Sweeney, starring Immaculate, starring Immaculate, opened in fourth place with 5.3 million in ticket sales. In the film, Sweeney plays an American nun who joins a convent in the Italian countryside and discovers horrifying secrets within. Topping the box office with another supernatural power, though more family-friendly film, the legacy sequel Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which took in a total of 45.2 million domestically, 16.4 million internationally, for a total of 61 million. According to Variety, Frozen Empire is just barely ahead of the franchise's previous entry, Ghostbusters Afterlife, which I, I enjoyed Ghostbusters Afterlife. Both recent Ghostbusters film have incorporated original cast members Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Ernie Hudson with newer characters played by Paul Rudd, McKenna Grace, and Stranger Things star Finn Wolford. R- rounding out the top slots were Dune Part 2 with $17.6 million. Sitting comfortably in second place, DreamWorks Animation's Kung Fu Panda 4 was $16.8 million in third, and the Mark Wahlberg-led drama Author of the King in fifth with $4.4 million. Is that a quid dinky dink that that horror film earned six 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 six? That is freaking crazy. I thought that was crazy. Rochelle, what's up, Gunner Girl? How's it going? I need to fish. Matthew goes talking about David um, Dalmalshin. Uh, know him? He was from the early 90s Flash TV series created by people who made lots of good films and shows. I like the Rocketeer, the wrong guy is Viper, the sentinel he was also in the last voyage of the dementor as well he always plays whenever i see him he always plays like these weird characters like these strange and unusual characters but that's what makes him that's what makes him stand out because he's always like this weird uh crazy character i think in last he wasn't like this weird character though in last voyage of the dementor he was like a normal person (laughs) Logical Spock, Love Fox 11, and the people there, even though I don't live there in California. I actually like um, KTLA. Honey, 2800 goes, he's sort of like Johnny Depp in his role choices yes he is he 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 chooses like weird and an outlandish like characters probably most people wouldn't choose but he chooses them but that i i I think that's what makes him stand out though But that's still crazy that a horror film made six 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 six. I think that's just crazy. 
so I wanted to share about that one. Um, and it's uh, I never heard of, actually I've never heard of that film until I read that article. So now I'm intrigued in uh I'm kind of glad that it is coming to Shutter on April 19th, and I'm going to check it out for sure. I do know there's a few um, upcoming films, uh, like The Omen. I'm probably not going to see it in the theater, but The Omen's coming out on April 5th. Um, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice is September 6th. It's more of the end of the summer. Then there's I I just saw, I think it was a, a I think it was a teaser trailer for Alien Rom Romulus, I believe. That looked good. I'm looking forward to that, actually. And I'm sure there's other ones. I think there's... Um, there's a few other ones that came out already. Like the one with the bear. It's Blumhouse. Imaginary, I think is the name of it. I didn't see that one, but... That, that one, I believe, is in theaters um, with the bear called Chauncey. I like the concept, but I don't think I'm going to really... I haven't seen it yet, but what I've seen of it, um, I may like it. And then the um the omen that's coming out on April 5th, the first omen, my bad. Um, it's a prequel to the 1976 film, The Omen. But I don't know about that one because I saw some things in the trailer that kind of was like, no. But there are a few coming out that um, I'm kind of scrolling through like a list of what's coming out. I am actually looking forward to Maxine, which is the, uh, if you guys are familiar with X, um, with Ty West's X and Pearl. Um, I am looking forward to Maxine. They have not announced a release date for it, though. So that's kind of like. I mean, it says it's coming out this year, but there is no release date as of yet. Which is unfortunate. Thank you, I Need to Fish. I appreciate that. I like the close-up of Lisa. Thank you. No, serious, I appreciate that. I Need to Fish. And thank you. D-Dice is asking, is the pinche duck back there? It is! And it's not the one um, above my head. That's his long distant co cousin, Skella Goose. <laughs> Dusty, how's it going? Bernadette goes, I'm not even going to look for that pinche duck. I can't see quack. I have a picture. I took a picture. I need to share it, though. I took a picture of the Skeledino um, that one of my neighbors has out in their front yard. They literally have a Skeledino and a baby Skeledino in their front yard. I think it's so cool. Someone actually complained about it because they posted on the on the, the city uh, Facebook page. And somebody complained, but they were like, we just do it because we want to make people laugh and smile. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I don't know who would not like it. So I'm going to share that um, after my stream. I forgot to post it. I was going to post it in Telegram. So uh, after my stream, I'm going to post it there. But it's, it's cool. Because I'm like, should I get a Skeledino? Hmm. <laughs> All right, guys, have you got, have you guys, gals and ladies, heard of nine sixty six Lind Lindley Street or the house in Bridge Bridgeport, Connecticut, at nine sixty six Lindley Lindley Street? That's like a tongue twister, almost Lindley. Hold on here. Okay. Go 
Chris Burgos, I can't see him like always. <laughs> D-Nice goes, maybe you have celebrities living in your neighborhood so they don't want to be found. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Heather Whatever goes, yes. Rochelle has said yes. All right. So this one, this, our next article. Carol goes, my mom and dad had one for years in their front yard. They named this. Skeleton Diana the dinosaur and dressed her for the holiday. That's Carol. That's what my neighbors do. They um they'll put uh well they haven't put the Easter garb on it because they think of the weather. But um they put the uh the you know the top hat and the like a green wreath for uh St. Patty's Day. And then summertime they have it like with the lays and the to I don't think they put a shirt on them, but they put like the lay a lay lays and um like like a sun hat and stuff like that for summertime. <laughs> All right, guys, this article is from iHorror. And they claim that this house. Is more terrifying than the Am the house in Amityville, which some believe is haunted. Some believe it's not. Even the people living at the Amityville one says that there's nothing going on. And this this article is about a year old. There is a haunted house in Bridgeport, Connecticut that doesn't get the attention the one in Amityville does. But in 1974, it caused a media stir that captivated the country and nobody ever talks about it. Not even genre movie folks. By the end of the story, you, like the many witnesses in 1974, will wonder what's real and what isn't. What did happen Inside this tiny house in the middle of the block on Lindley Street. And it is a tiny house. The Conjuring. Before we get to that, let's talk about the recent upswing in ghost story cinema and celebrity paranormal investigations. Starting with James Wan's Conjuring Universe, a fourth film is currently in the works. The Conjuring franchise have given us some great scares over the last decades. These based on a true story, earmarks on Haunted America and Across the Pond have reinvigorated the poltergeist pop culture phenomenon that was so popular in the 70s. Based on the real-life case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, The Conjuring Cinematic Universe started with the Perrin family in Rhode Island, which, with that house... Because a family member does go on and speaks about the hauntings that happened in the house because she grew up in the house. But I'm still 50-50 when it comes to that house. I feel like... I feel like with the money, because of the movie, it makes people want to believe or makes people to believe that it is haunted. But I'm like 50-50 with it when it comes to the Conjuring house. I feel like... Because there's a movie based on it, it kind of loses its appeal a little bit to me. So I kind of, I'm kind of 50 50 with it. I don't feel like, and I feel like in a way, they do allow you to stay at the Conjuring House, but I feel like it's a money grab. As well, I think um, when Doof Doof was on here, um, in a past stream, she had said it was like 500 bucks or something a night or something like that. So to me, I'm like 50, 50, even with one of the parents, I think it was one of the daughters. She goes on and talks about her experiences and I'm still kind of 50, 50 with that. 
Although Mr. Warren died in 2006, Lorraine served as a consultant to The Conjuring. She maintained before her death in 2019 that she didn't allow the filmmakers to take too much creative license. She asserted everything you see on screen is actually how it happened. The sequel, Conjuring 2, moved to Britain and documented the famous Einfield haunting. That case involved two young sisters who were tormented by a ghost that threw things, spoke by way of possession, and was just an overall supernatural baddie. Cops, priests, and social workers went on record to confirm the reports. Lorraine also helped with the case. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., the Lutz family was battling their own demons on a now-famous lot in Amityville. Again, the Warrens were on hand to assist. Wendy goes, movies follow lures, some true or not. I like the lures. True. True. I like the lore, too. Leonor, what's up? 966 Lindy, Lindley Street. If you say that, too, it's a tongue twister. But there is another chilling tale that the Warrens were involved in that nobody talks about. It took place in Bridgeport at 966 Lindy Street, Lindley Street, in 1974. And it caused such a media circus that, neighborhood, that the neighborhood would go on lockdown. Reporters, witnesses, and other professionals would go on record saying they saw furniture move without provocation, hovering refrigerators, and physical attacks. In the book, The World's Most Haunted House, writer Bill Hall takes a deep dive into the case. What's staggering is not only the bizarre happenings that took place, but they were so well documented by so many trusted sources. And it is a super small house. It's crazy. Respected witnesses document their experiences. Firefighters and law enforcement agents have gone on record to say they witnessed everything from chairs moving on their own, crucifixes being ejected from their wall anchors, and knives being thrown by an invisible force. The activity seemed to center around a little girl. Gerard and Laura Gooden lived in the small bungalow when they adopted their young daughter, Marcia, in, 19, in 1968. It wasn't long before strange things began to happen in the house. Little things that people usually ignore. Still, the activity was strong enough to captivate the family. People say when Marcia was around, the, was around, the events would intensify, but even when she was gone, things would get crazy. The Goodins were subject to a loud rhythmic pounding in their walls. The source could never be located. Items would disappear from where they were left, only to be found in other spots in the house. Doors would slam. Police investigated the incident, but even they were perplexed after finding nothing. The Media Frenzy in 1974, the property was a hotbed of activity not only from the poltergeist, but media attention. The Warrens were called in as the American Society for Psych Psychical Psychical Research and the Psychic Psychical Research Foundation. I know I'm not pronouncing that properly. Police were on hand 24 hours a day and interviewed the family. At that time, there were reports of TVs being pushed from their stands, window blinds snapping up and down and down the shelves falling off the walls. The public frenzy had started too. Onlookers would crowd the street in front of the haunted house to see if they could witness something for themselves. One citizen even tried to burn the house down. What? The entire street had to eventually be cordoned off. At this time, the entity reported reportedly showed itself, according to Hall's book. It resembled a large cohesive Assemblage of smoky, yellowish, white, gauzy mist. All right. Just imagine living next door. And there were two. If living next door to this house when all this was happening in 1974. That is crazy. And they're saying it had to be cordoned off. I wonder if you were able to go to your house. Or if you wanted to go to your house. 
I mean, just imagine knowing that things were being moved around in your neighbor's house by an unseen force. I don't know if I would want to if I would want to live next door. <laughs> And then having all those people in front of your house, oh my gosh. The cat talks. Not only were there physical manipulations, there were also audio phenomenon. People reported hearing Sam the family cat say weird things like jingle bells and bye-bye. Outside, plastic garden swans reportedly made frightening noises too. The website, Damn Connecticut, also wrote about the story. In their comments section, one person, Nielsen P., claims to have worked in City Hall in 1974 in the records room of the Bridgeport Police Department. They had this to say. We gained a copy of a written report by an officer who was present when the paranormal crap hit the fan on Lindley Street. The most chilling account was when in his writings and the cat said to the officer, how's your brother Bill doing? And the officer looked down and replied, my brother's dead. The cat then scowled. I know, swearing repeatedly at the officer, then ran off. Other visual events in the, in the report included a levitating refrigerator and an armchair that flipped over and could not be lifted back into place by the officers. What? One officer who witnessed it all took an immediate leave of absence, having been that shaken by the experience. I today firmly believe these events took place in the home. Wow. The weird part is the person writing this about the cat talking to the officer. How's your brother Bill? And the officer looking down at the cat and saying my brother's dead and the cat's going I know. I, I was like huh? Matthew goes, now nah, my old girl rascal meows like she was saying hello. There's a lot of cats that can meow and it sounds hello like hello. Elaine goes, sounds like a Tales of the Dark Side story. <laughs> And it, and it seems like this, all this was put into a police report because this is happening to officers. So they're getting this information from a police report that they had taken in 1974. Leonor goes pet cemetery. <laughs> Actually, I don't think that the, Leonor, if it was pet cemetery, the pet wouldn't have been so, so friendly. <laughs> A hoax? Levitating fr frigidaires and creepy cats aside, the whole thing came to an abrupt halt when a police officer allegedly saw Marcia try to tip over a television set with her foot when she thought no one was looking. After questioning Marcia, eventually admitted to doing everything in the house on her own and the case was closed, deemed a hoax. Or was it? Although her parents disputed the claim, Marcia was quick to admit her part in the haunting. But questions remain about how she could be in two places at once. How respected witnesses saw things happen when Marcia wasn't even in the house and why things continue to happen even after the confession. Thank you, Leonor, for the super fitness pair super sticker. Hearts for Leonor. Thank you for the support, Leonor. You're awesome. And Leonor, I hope you are on the mend. And taking it easy so we have a quick recovery. But thank you, Leonora. I appreciate it. The case was eventually forgotten and regarded as fraud. Bill Hall's book, The World's Most Haunted House, is the quintessential story about the Lin Lee haunting. His book includes unprecedented interviews from firefighters and other reputable witnesses who were there. They speak about their experiences and what they saw. It's been reported that Marcia, the girl behind the haunting, died in 2015 at the age of 51. Still standing! The house still stands in the same spot it did over 40 years ago and looks the same as it did back then. You can visit it personally. You can also type it into Google Maps. 
But instead of bothering the current residents, keep a safe distance away if you decide to go. Yeah, because there's people actually living in the house. That kind of sucks. You'd be like looking out your window and you see cars driving by gawking at your house. That's just crazy. Whatever you believe, this haunted house case was definitely one for the history books, if only for the attention it got from the public and the detailed professional eyewitnesses documented as it happened. The story has been updated. It was originally posted on March 2020. So they updated it. Guys, what do you think of the Lynn, Lynn Lee house in Bridgeport, Connecticut? Chris Barber goes, it sounds like a con job. D Nice goes, they asked for it when they bought it. True. Leonora goes, they'll be like, get away from the house. Elaine goes, creepy. Heather, whatever goes, how much did they pay? I'm wondering. It's like a small house. <laughs> like, it's still standing. So you. Which is which is kind of cool. They didn't tear it down, but it's like a super small house. Super small house. So that's basically what it looks like today. Heather, whatever goes, I lived in a house like that, really cold. D nice goes, same thing happened. Same thing with the house Charmed was filmed in. They preserved the set pieces. It's in Los Angeles. I'm sure like the house um from Fast and the Furious that's in Los Angeles. I'm sure they get the same thing. Um, what's cool about uh the house in um that was in Halloween where uh where Lori sits with the pumpkin. They actually, I have actually been there. They they have pumpkins on the porch. So you could take a picture in the same spot where Lori was in Halloween. They actually, they were like, take a picture. Here's a pumpkin. Just bring the pumpkin back. It's kind of, like they embrace it in Pasadena. So that's kind of cool. Leonardo's maybe historical, so they can't tear it down. I need to fish. It is crazy that uh, you can look up even your own house and it pops up on Google. I'm like, what the heck? Or I'm like, oh, that's an old picture. I don't have that car anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> But it's weird. But what do you guys think of that house? Do you think it was a con job? Or do you think it actually happened? Do you think the young child was making this stuff up? Because there is actual police reports. Um officers accounts that's why they're trying to kind of think that it's not a fraud because there was officer accounts to it that were where officers actually saw what was going on i mean i don't know if i had a haunting if i would call the police for that but because they would think i'm crazy but i guess back then it you could back in 1974 i don't know what the protocol of that was but <laughs> kyle goes i found the house from the grumpy old men movies I uh I need to fish says maybe both maybe he's saying maybe it is haunted and maybe there was a little bit of Marcia maybe possibly getting attention maybe she maybe she wanted the attention she was adopted D nice goes the houses from Halloween are not across from each other but next to each other if you want I could share that video again yeah go for it D nice 
You can also, um, you can visit the hedge too in Pasadena, uh, where Michael kind of creeps out. Jennifer Marie goes, cops usually don't believe in ghosts, so if they are convinced, then maybe. Carol goes, I think they embellish some of it. True. But I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't openly be talking to people and, and saying... Oh my god, my house is haunted. They they would they would like automatic fifty one fifty and throw us in, in you know the mental the loony bin or something. That's what I feel would happen now if you <laughs> But I guess back then maybe it was an occurrence that you did call. I mean I get calling a priest to cleanse the house and all that stuff. I, I understand that part, but but which they did not mention in the article, but to me, it's a little strange. I need to fish is going. What if we are all in one big loony bin? True, you never know. <laughs> Leave our ghost sage. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of cool that you could go visit. So anybody in the area of Bridgeport, Connecticut, check out the house. I would. If I was in that area, I would definitely check out the house. I would not disturb the occupancies. Occupants. I'd go out in front and go like this. Take a picture. Same thing with the um, Nightmare on Elm Street house in L.A. as well. I mean, it didn't seem like, I feel like if you have any of those types of houses, you're going to have the people going there. So it's like no sense and you should embrace it. Um, as long as you're respectful, I don't think any of us, I, it shouldn't be a problem. Cause I've been to the I've been to the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, house with the red. It still has the red door, with the red door and everything. And as long as you're respectful and not walking in their yard and all that kind of stuff, being on the sidewalk and taking pictures, I don't see anything wrong with it at all. I mean, I would embrace it. Like the Amityville house, I heard like they're not very nice. Though I've never been to the Animeville house, it's just what I've heard. Elaine goes, I went to the exorcist house, took a pic in the car. <laughs> you could do that too. However, I mean, still, as long as you're not like looking in their windows and being, you know, being disrespectful, I, I see nothing wrong. Rochelle, thank you for dropping by. Heather, whatever goes, my youngest has seen the Goonies house. And you know people are going to go and look for this house as well. Leonor was uh, saying I got to drive through the set for the cat in the hat city, downtown city. Here, don't remember the exact city, but seeing it was killer. I guess in, um, for you guys that are local to, to SoCal here or the LA area, I guess they rebuilt, uh, Toys R Us in Burbank for a, for, um, uh, a Michael Jackson biopic or something like that that they're filming. So there is a constructed Toys R Us, um, in an old Kmart building in Burbank right now which is kind of cool it even has toys inside i think i saw a video where someone was actually filming the inside or not inside but they were filming through the windows 
they did a uh like a little kind of like a quick video Heather, whatever goes, I think there are areas, spiritual strongholds where stuff is, not everywhere. True. Julissa goes, I miss Toys R Us. The small section in Macy's stores are not the same thing. True. It isn't. Joanne goes, yeah, it's just a movie set, though, but it's kind of cool to see, though. I've seen, um, because it's on the news, so I've seen it on the news. Uh, hear the local news and I'm like oh that's pretty cool it's still cool to see though regardless if it's a movie set or not Gunner Girl they're filming I believe they're filming a biopic for of uh, Michael Jackson or something like that is what I read or heard All right, guys, my next article is from Borderzine. I kept seeing this pop up uh, several times on just as I was scrolling. And I was like, oh, why does this keep popping up? So I looked it up because it kept claiming that this, it was like a school so haunted. That they left everything as it is. And I'm like, what is this? So this article is on El Paso High School, I believe. And it's from Borderzine. So it's a fairly old article. Lingering memories of ghostly images and echoing pep rallies haunt El Paso High School. Because I kept seeing this and I'm like, what happened here? Like, why do I keep seeing this? I'm like, it's a high school. <laughs> El Paso. It's dark and late, usually around 2 a.m. when the faint notes of the Tiger Fight song begin to sound. Then, more clearly, cheerleaders cheering and students laughing and stamping feet, cascading into a pep rally and a locked, empty auditorium. You are hearing ghosts. You might also think New Orleans, New Orleans is the most haunted city in the U.S., but it is actually El Paso, says Tobias H., Toby Tovar, 55, a math instructor at El Paso High School. And El Paso High School is the most haunted building in town. Oh, I did not know that. Um, Matthew. Matthew St. Arnie's house from John Carpenter's Christine is in South Pasadena, California. Same neighborhood Carpenter used for Halloween. Oh, cool. I did not know that. Dun, 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 as Leonor says. El Paso High School, located at 800, 800 East Schouster, opened for classes in 1916, and since then, Lady on the Hill has graduated many prominent citizens and has captured hundreds of trophies, plaques, and championships in all fields. Since the days of its construction, Paranormal events have taken place at the school, said Tovar. There have been numerous interior modifications designed to accommodate a growing student body and changing educational theories. As a result, a number of the original classrooms and hallways are no more, but there are stories that some of these modifications were done because of spirits that seem to have an affinity for certain areas of the building. It is said that there is a hall that leads to a balcony that is also closed off. People say they have seen an image of a girl jumping from the balcony. According to the story, every single day, mist and fog roam the abandoned hallway, and that seems to be some gooey stuff on the ceiling. And there seems to be gooey stuff on the ceiling. Ooh. This unusual activity stems from an incident that happened nearly 35 years ago when a distraught teenage girl killed herself by slitting her wrist and then throwing herself from a balcony at the end of the hallway. There were, there have been enough sightings that a wall was built completely closing the stairway leading up to the haunted hallway. Wow. 
However, and it's sad too. However, this tragic young lady racing to her death is not the only unexplainable thing that has been seen at this historic school. Almost from the day it was constructed, odd things have happened. Wendy goes, I beg to differ. New England is haunted as F. That's a sad story, but even the school decided to block off that area. That's crazy. In the recent El Paso High School yearbook, there is a reproduction of an old photograph showing a young lady in a white dress watching the original construction of the building in 1916. However, this unknown woman was not in the original photograph. Who was she? And most importantly, how did she get in the picture? A trophy case just inside the original front entrance of this grand old school contains a photo of the 1985 graduating class. Everyone else in the photo shows up clear and distinct, but there is the, the one young lady whose features are faint and fuzzy. Her image looks like it was inserted after the photo was taken, explained Tovar. The figure in the picture is at the end of a row of a row primarily of teachers. There are two young ladies, one toward the right end of the group and one on the left center of the group, who are looking intently toward where the mysterious young lady is standing. Were these two young ladies perhaps the one, only ones sensitive enough to realize that something was wrong? This mysterious girl was not part of the particular graduating class, and no one in the class that was photographed admitted knowing the identity of the girl. But... Regardless of how she got into the picture, she is very clearly in the photograph. A lovely, lonely-looking girl, smiling for the camera. Leonardo goes suspicious. Tyranna goes very creepy. Joanne goes gooey stuff on the ceilings, wet toilet paper balls. Paper balls. True. Spitballs, it could be. Heather, whatever, saying. Tovar had a wealth of stories about events at the school. About 15 years ago, it snowed in El Paso to the point that schools were closed. A few teachers and students had arrived before the closure announcement. Those teachers and students who had been able to make it to school were not allowed to leave due to unsafe road conditions. Having nothing else to do, a group of students and teachers decided to explore the school, starting with the tunnels in the basement, he said. At one point, several of the teachers crawled through a small opening, eventually coming to a brick wall that blocked the tunnel. The bricks were old and the cement between them were, was crumbling, but it was clear that these bricks had been added long after the surrounding brickwork. Curious, one of the teachers pushed on the newer bricks until some gave way revealing a large, dark cavity. Pushing a flashlight through the hole, they discovered a sealed-off classroom. Leonora's like, why would you go in there? I need to fish goes. I'm sleeping with an extra light on tonight, hoping my, hoping my pillows, holding my, hugging my pillows like I wish I had a girlfriend. The discovery surprised everyone. As no one had even heard a whisper that there might be sealed off classrooms in the building, said Tovar. The room was small and contained antique desks of the type seen in the television show Little House on the Prairie. Oh, that is cool. There was no doubt that the classroom dated from the original construction of the building. The classroom was still set up with desks in place, text and student notebooks still in place waiting for the students. That is crazy. There were baby Ruth candy bar wrappers on the floor from a time this product sold for five cents as well as numerous five cent Coke bottles. I would so take those. I don't care if the, the building was haunted. 
<laughs> and one of the students' notebooks lying on a desk, they found, in addition to algebra notes and completed problems, a very racy love letter from the owner of the book to a boy, he explained. There was a second sealed-off classroom nearby, also ready to receive students, now filled with only dust and silence. Try as they might, they were never able to discover why two classrooms would be sealed off so fast that they would not be cleaned of debris. Desks, nor texts, nor the students be given time to claim their personal articles. That is weird that everything kind of is in place like they left in a hurry. The vast basement has been used as an overflow morgue during several of our nation's wars. During World War II, there were so many casualties shipped here that bodies had been stored in the basement until the next of kin could be notified. During the Spanish flu epidemic in the early part of the 1900s, so many died that the bodies were also stored in the basement of the high school. Oh, uh, and you wonder why it's haunted? Come on! <laughs> dun, dun, dun! Joanne does not believe that. Kyle goes to this school in Asia. I mean, they had bodies in the ba they stored bodies in the basement during World War II and the Spanish flu. And you wonder why. Elaine goes, they were just asking for ghosts. Exactly. Leonora goes like an ancient Indian burial ground. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. <laughs> that is just crazy. At one point in his career in the early 1980s, Toby Tovar, I don't think anybody ever uses the name Toby, was the basketball coach for the eighth grade basketball team. That year, the eighth grade team was undefeated and they were scheduled to play the only other undefeated team in the city. Each afternoon, the 8th grade team had gym time scheduled from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. in the gym immediately below his classroom. A disquieting event happened during practice one day. Just after they started practice, two waist-high access doors leading to the tunnels flew violently open, slamming back against the wall on either side. Naturally, the assumption eventually reached, even though there was little, if any, wind outside, was that a freak draft coming down one of the many chimneys had blown the latch doors open. The doors were shut and long, heavy benches were placed in front of the doors to make sure that they would stay closed. The kids had gone back to their scrimmage game, and they were all at the far end of the court. At about 7 p.m., the bench went flying across the court, and the, door, and the doors they had been security latch again flew open violently. Tovar related, suffice it to say that this team made up of a gang made up of gang members who didn't fear the devil himself, led by a coach who, in his use, had led two tough barrio gangs, decided to leave the building without even taking the time to turn out the lights. A few years ago, Angelo Plec Cluda, Cluda was the journalism instructor at El Paso High School, related Tovar. He and the yearbook stack composed of journalism students would work long into the night to produce a first-class yearbook. One night, he sent the last students home and planned on being close behind them, but he had a few last-minute things to do. It was almost exactly 11 p.m. when he finally left. According to Tovar, when Plecluda, I am probably so butchering the last name, turned toward the exit, Standing in a pool of dim red light thrown by the exit sign was a young lady wearing a blue chiffon dress of the type that would be worn to the school prom in the 40s or 50s. Thinking it was one of his students, asked her what she was doing there and told her to be go home. The girl turned and looked directly at him, her expression one of deep sadness. As he walked toward her, she began to become transparent and he noticed that she was not standing on the floor, but rather hovering in midair about a foot off the floor. When he was only a few feet from her, she glided back into the deeper darkness of the hallway and disappeared. That is crazy. Danny Mc 
clip it. McKillop was a former All-American and has been inducted into the UTEP Minor Hall of Fame for the track and field, began Tover. He was also track coach for El Paso High. One night in the late 70s or early 80s, Coach McClippet, McKillip, <laughs> McKillip, and the El Paso track team returned to the school very late at night after a track meet in Austin. The track team's locker room was in the area beneath Tover's classroom. The students came into the building to drop off their track gear and pick up their possessions they had left in their lockers. The school was dark and silent when the buses arrived, explained Tovar. As the students were gathering their possessions, McKillop suddenly heard the sounds of the Tiger fight song, cheerleaders performing their cheers, and the sound of a very spirited pep rally coming from the second floor auditorium. Baffled, but thinking it might be a surprise reception for his track team that had just won the state championship, Coach McKillop ran up the stairs to the second floor, and even though everything was dark, he dashed for the auditorium a hundred feet away. Just as he reached the doors to the auditorium, all the sounds stopped. He found that the doors to the auditorium were locked, and he could no longer see nor hear anything. Coach McKillop unlocked the auditorium and entered. He found everything dark and quiet. There was no sign that anyone had been there recently. Puzzled more than ever, he returned to the locker room where some of his students were still waiting for him. No sooner had he rejoined the students than once again they all heard the sounds of the Tiger fight song, cheerleaders leading cheers and voices screaming. Followed by most of the remaining students, Coach McKillop dashed back up the stairs toward the auditorium. Once again, halfway to the door, all sounds stopped. The school was dark and silent as a tomb. Whoa! Leonarcos, oh, the ghosts were congratulating them. Yes. <laughs> it is strange, Joanne, going strange. It is super strange. The building is steeped in history, but it hides its secrets well. Doing modifications to the auditorium, workers removed the steps leading to the stage and found hidden one or two books per step, an entire set of a Catholic encyclopedia hidden beneath the steps. The set of books is complete, lavishly illustrated, and a real treasure. How did they get inside those steps? Who put them there? Most importantly, why were they placed in such an unusual hiding place? El Paso High custodians quit their duties at 9 p.m. so unless someone is working late after this hour, the massive building is deserted. The lights are out and the alarms are set. The building is completely secured. But with El Paso High School, it can never be said with certainty that the building is desert deserted and secured. The restless dead walk the dark, said Tover. Guys, what did you think of this article about El Paso High School? Do you believe it's haunted? I kind of do. It was used it stored dead bodies in the basement during World War II and the Spanish flu. So, uh, I think there is something there. It is creepy. Kyle with the don 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 Gunner girl going creepy for sure. Elaine goes, that's bizarre. That is crazy. Now I know why that article kept popping up. <laughs> kept floating around and I kept coming. And I'm like, why? And it's kind of crazy that uh, they found, like, hidden classrooms, like, left untouched and boarded up. So I'm wondering why. Chris Barber goes, sounds haunted to me. Joanne goes, never seen any ghosts at high school I worked at. Allegedly, the high school I went to, they say, is haunted. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Leonor goes, oh, so many possibilities. There is. And how one of the teachers saw um, a ghostly apparition of someone dressed up in a prom dress from the 40s or 50s. That is that is crazy. 
he automatically thought it was one of his students, but I think the clothes would have would have told me something was up. <laughs> the fashion. But some people dress up. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, because some people do dress. They do dress in the uh vintage when they do go to prom. But that uh, that that is crazy. I wouldn't mind going there. Serious. That is a high school I would want to go to. <laughs> Sounds like so crazy. What do you guys think in the chat? Think about El Paso High School. Or have you been, have anybody been there or been in that area? Leonora goes bodies under the school. That is. That's why right when I read that, I was like, no wonder. There's like restless spirits there. I don't. <laughs> Wendy goes, has anyone ever gone to a high school reunion? I did not. I think I kind of had. Um, I had a get together with. Because I used to. Um. My two best friends in high school were guys, and we kind of had our own um, little reunion, so I never went to the actual high school one. Because they went, for the high school reunion, they want some ridiculous price to go, and I'm like, dude. Eli, go swing by and pick me up, Lisa. <laughs> Kyle goes high school of the dead. Sounds like an anime. It does, actually. Kyle goes, my school is too broke and ghetto to do reunions. No, with my reunions, they charge us. That's why I didn't go. They wanted like a ridiculous amount. Yes, Gunner Girl. High school reunions are crazy price. They are. Like, I get it. But I didn't. <laughs> but I haven't gone. I know I have one coming up, I think, in a couple years. But. Elaine goes, I went to my 20 year pregnant with my fourth kid. <laughs> Wendy goes, my high school friends are friends. I don't need a reunion. Yeah, like I have the guys I hung out with are my Facebook friends. Like I can keep in touch there. Chris, yours was 25 bucks? What? I think the last one, I think they wanted like 200 for mine or something like that. Some ridiculous amount. And I see other ones pop up because other ones pop up, for, but they're for different years. Like, oh, class 85, class reunion, uh, please contact so-and-so, uh, it's $200 or something. I was like, what? Wendy goes, if I went to a high school reunion, I would probably get locked up. That does not sound good, Wendy. Why, what would you, or do you have a lot of enemies or something in high school, Wendy? Leonor goes, mine did too. High school reunions, they go way too overboard. And I think it's not even the school that, that puts it together. It's like people from your class that puts it together. Ah, Wendy goes, first cousin is the chief of police. D Nice goes, mine was at a bar. Everyone was too loopy to co converse. I have my core friends, so it's okay. <laughs> Joanne graduated class of 74. Oh, wow. But definitely that high school, I wouldn't have mind going to. <laughs> I would not. Serious. That high school, I'd probably, I wouldn't mind um, going and walking around if they let us. 
Dusty goes, my 50th was during the big C, so very few showed up. I kind of felt bad for for people that were graduating, um, that graduated, even if it was sixth grade to junior high school or um, uh, junior high school to high school and then graduating high school and they couldn't have a graduation during that time. That kind of, I felt sad. Gunner Girl goes class of 81 here. Jennifer Burry goes, when my tenure came up, I added a ton of people who didn't go to the school, to the Facebook event page, who all acted like they did. Took them three days to realize, and I got banned. <laughs> hey, that's the way to do it, though, Jennifer Burry. Carol's class of 82. Jennifer Marie goes, I was a prankster in high school and couldn't let my reputation fa fail. Leonor goes, class of old clubs reaching out, then going there felt like going backwards. People who weren't cool with you. And now trying being a grown up. Um. Trying being a grown up, you and a bit still. Cre <laughs> Chris was class of eighty three, Kyle was class of o three, Angelica's class of two thousand four. We got like a mix of everyone here. That's super cool. Nerd report in the house. Oh, hold on, guys. I knocked something over. Heather, whatever goes, I only went to my husband's reunions. The kids were remarkably, remarkably similar. Julius is class of 91. Leonore is like partying like class of 1999. I don't think I'll probably go to the next one that's coming up. I don't even I don't even know what. What do you do? You get 10, 20, 30, like it goes like that. I don't even know if we're going to have one. I think I have one coming up in a couple of years. But I'm probably not going to go. Jennifer Marie goes, I really don't have an interest in attending any reunions. I either those I wanted to keep in touch with. I just um, have this whole time. Yeah, I agree. I, like, I don't want to revisit. I mean, the people that I was friends with, I kind of, I have them on Facebook. So if I want to talk, I could talk. Like, I know what's going on with them. And... <laughs> Gunner girl, I was, um, I'm in a class of 96. I think I have one coming up in two years. Leonardo goes, I went to a reunion and you always get, do you remember? I'm like, nope. Are you married with kids? I'm like, nope. Then the face drop. Oh, I'll be the same thing. I go, do you remember me? I'll probably remember people, but it's people I don't want to remember because they were the popular kids and I didn't care for the popular kids. <laughs> your reunions i don't i don't they're not like because you know on on tv and in the movies they they portray the reunions as like i don't know cool but i feel like the reunions nowadays or in real life aren't
Kyle is like, do you remember? Yep, piss off. I know, that's probably what I would be. I'd be like, politely. And I'll be walking around going, F you. I'll be walking away. Chris was like, I had a blast at my 10th. <laughs> all right guys my next article because we went down a rabbit hole started talking about reunions <laughs> that's what we do here <laughs> oh heather whatever i love that movie 10 things i hate about you it had um uh what's his face um oh i can't think of his name um oh my god i'm having a brain fart but I love that movie. I loved a lot of the movies back in the day. Wendy, I've seen reunion pics. I'm like, dang, I look way better than you, bully. Yeah, I know. I it's weird because there, I live. I think I I live down the street um, from a girl uh, that used to pick on me in sixth grade, and she still lived like her family. She I think she still lives with. She, she lives with her family and I, it's funny Wendy, that you said that because i think the same thing <laughs> heath ledger thank you bernadette like the older i get the more brain farts i'm getting i don't know what's going on so <laughs> Leonora goes, I actually have one this year and always walk away. They always are come over and hang. I feel like the Stanley Hotel twins. Come play with us. They're like, come play with us, Danny. <laughs> but in this place, come play with us, Leonor. <laughs> so this article is from All That's Interesting. Probably one of my favorite sites because Seriously, it really has all that's interesting. Um, this is the chilling story of the unsolved lumber lumber baron in murders. In 1970, two teenage girls were murdered at Denver's Lumber Baron Inn. More than 50 years later, their killer is still unknown, but some guests say the victim's ghosts still roam the halls. Dun dun dun. Now, Leonora, you got me doing that all the time. <laughs> Once the Lumber Baron Inn was the home of its namesake, Lumen, Lum, Lumen, oh my God, Lumber Baron John Muat, a lavish mansion he constructed for his wife and their five children, the building was equal parts home and showcase of Muat's work. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly. But as often happens with old buildings, Muat's mansion eventually passed from the family's ownership and exchanged hands several times before it became little more than a deteriorating tenement building. By the mid-20th century, it was a skeleton of its former self, the sort of place where low stakes criminals, drug addicts, and teenage runaways congregated together. In short, it was a place where people went when they had nowhere else to go. Wendy goes, Lisa needs a sound bite and a button. I do. <laughs> Unfortunately, these sort of seedy locales often attracted tragedy, and the Lumber Baron Inn was no exception. In 1970, a 17-year-old teenage runaway was R and murdered in her room. When her 18-year-old friend walked in on the act, the man pew-pewed and killed her too. The perpetrator of the Lumber Baron Inn murders was never identified. The mansion eventually changed hands once more and underwent a complete restoration, but the tragedy of the Lumber Baron, Inn, Lumber Baron Inn murder still haunts it to this day, perhaps in more ways than one. Have any of you guys heard of the Lumber, Lumber, Lumber Baron murder in murders? I have not, so this is kind of interesting. I 
I need the fish goes, nope. Heather whatever goes, nope. Isn't that smoking in the bathroom? Isn't that a song? By, um... I want to say, like, Motley Crue, but I don't think it's Motley Crue. The early histor history of the Lumber Baron Inn. In 1890, Scottish immigrant John Muat. Okay, Leonardo goes not Motley. Yes, Gunner Girl goes smoking in the boys' room. Yes, Motley Crew. Okay, I was close. I was right. All right. I knew there was a song. <laughs> Chris Barber goes, they did the remake. Okay, that's close. I'm still close. In, 19 in 1890, Scottish immigrant John Moat built a home from his family in Denver, Colorado. Moat had made a name for himself in the lumber industry and amassed a large fortune, eventually starting his own company. Moat Lumber. According to Legends of America, the Moat Lumber Company constructed more than 200 buildings in Denver between 1889 and 1892, helping the town grow from a humble mining camp to the city it is today. Moat wanted his home, however, to be the best. It wasn't just that it was a massive 8,500 square foot mansion. Each room featured a different type of wood. Each fireplace was intricately carved. The dining room had carved rosettes representing the trees used to make the guest rooms. And the guest rooms themselves featured private baths and phones. I don't know why you would want a phone... I mean, I guess the phone is not in the bath, but the way they, they said it in the article just put that in my mind that they had a phone in the bathroom. <laughs> but the Muat children grew up, moved out, and started families of their own. Moat and his wife eventually moved out too. He lived in California by 1906, and the mansion transferred ownership. Per the Fort Carson Mountaineer, the mansion changed hands several times over the decades, eventually being turned into a 23-unit tenement building. The building was run down a stark contrast to the lavish showcase it had been in the past. Matthew going smoking in the boys' room originally by Brownsville Station. D-Nice goes, phones in the bathroom must have been rich. <laughs> yes, that's what, I, that's what I was thinking. Phones in the bathroom, but I don't know why you would want a phone in the bathroom. Though, a lot of times, when I'm in the restroom, a public restroom, there is a girl talking on the phone. Yeah, I'm in so-and-so store, and I'm just doing a little shopping. Is there anything you need? I'm like, what the hell are you talking on the phone while you're on the toilet? I don't know. That's weird for me. I would not talk on the phone while I'm on, on the toilet. That's just me. <laughs> but I've I've heard it there. I haven't seen it because, you know, you're in the next all over. But <laughs> it's, it's I don't know. It's just weird for me to be on the phone in the bathroom. That's just me. And I'm like, I don't care because if they choose to be on the phone. I'm going to go to the bathroom, flush the toilet and all that. I don't care. <laughs> I'm there to do my business and I want to get the hell out. <laughs> yeah, Elaine's like, excuse me, I need some TP, please. <laughs> Leonardo goes, instead of smoking in the bathroom, it's now talking in the bathroom. Exactly. Exactly. D nice goes, I don't want people listening to me. Yeah, same here. I was like, why? So that that when it said with bathrooms and phones, that kind of just brought that <laughs> from the article. The Lemon Baron Inn murders of Kara Noach and Marianne Weaver. 
In 1970, 16-year-old runaway Carly Noche, or Noche was living in a rented room at the tenement building known today as Lumber Baron Inn. Noche had dropped out of school and run away from home, but on October 11th, she seemingly had a change of heart. She celebrated her 17th birthday at her parents' house and made a bold announcement. In four days' time, she would move out of her apartment and resume her high school education. She had already found a job, too. Two days later, she was found dead inside of her apartment. That is sad. That is. That day, 18-year-old Marianne Weaver went to the Lumber Baron Inn to visit Noach and walked in at the worst possible moment. A man was in the apartment. He had already R. Noach, and many reports claim that Weaver arrived in time to witness him murder her, too. Caught in or just after the act, the man pew-pewed and killed Weaver. On October 13, 1970, Noach's body was found, or Noach, Noche's body or Noche's body was found lying under the bed. She had been strangled to death. Weaver's body was on the floor with a pew pew wound. After uh, over 50 years later, their murderer has not been found. That is sad and crazy because she was gonna she was taking her life in a different she was going down the right path like she changed had to change her heart and that's what happened that's sad within two decades the city of denver condemned the tenement building as it had fallen into almost complete and total disrepair disrepair it's likely they would have been it's likely that would have been the end of the story had it not been for walter and julie keller who purchased the building in 1991 and began the long process of restoring and remodeling the mansion, ultimately turning it into the Lumber Baron Inn. Thankfully, no further tragedies have plagued the Lumber Baron Inn, and it now operates as a successful bed and breakfast. But given its history, many guests and paranormal researchers have come forth with claims that the Log Baron Inn may, in fact, be haunted. Carol, I don't blame you. I've seen some disgusting things in restrooms that public restrooms that make me not want to go. I can hold it. Especially when you go to a, a music festival. And yeah, if you think public restrooms are nasty, a music festival restroom is like 300 times worse. And I'll. I'll I mean, if you get like the VIP section, you'll get like the nice porta potties, but even those are, are nasty. But most of them are like the porta potties. But the VIP section has like the flushing porta potties. But still, it's like when I go to a music festival, I do not want to use the restrooms. I try to avoid it. I'm like, let's go to the restroom before we go in. Kyle goes, there are a number of ghost towns in BC. Many of the homes still look as they did decades ago, frozen in time. Oh, that is cool. That's crazy. Chris goes, try a race weekend, Lisa. I'm pretty sure that uh, just as bad. That is smart. Wendy goes, um, sometimes you can't. I bring disinfectant and toilet barriers in my purse always. That's that's good. I think I may start doing that. The alleged haunting of the Lumber Baron Inn. With the Lumber, lumber cannot say lumber, Lumber Baron Inn fully restored and decorated with antique furniture and the neighborhood showing signs of improving, the Kellers converted the mansion mansion's basement into a single larger apartment and decided to move in themselves their work went beyond the interior as well they replanted the gardens on the property around the building and added decor reflective of the 1890s queen Anne style it originally flaunted Ooh, they did a good job Soon enough, Lumber Baron Inn and Gardens were open was open as a bed and breakfast wedding venue and event space but according to hauntedhouses.com, cool, that not all the Lumber Baron, 
that's not all the Lumberberry Inn has to offer. It is allegedly considered to be the most haunted place in Denver, with the reports of six spirits who continue to stalk its halls. Naturally, two of the alleged ghosts that haunt the Lumber Baron Inn are the spirits of Kara Noach and Marianne Weaver, who have reportedly been seen in the inn's Valentine's room, on the stairs, and in the hallway near their room. Guests have reported feeling cold spots and hearing strange noises from unknown sources. Walter Keller even reported similar experiences, saying that while working to renovate the inn, he felt his neck hair stand on end after an unnaturally cold gust of wind blew by him. Beyond the spirits of Noach, or no. Noche and Weaver, though guests and paranormal investigators have reported seeing a female apparition sometimes dressed as a flapper, the spirit of a maid, a male spirit believed to be a member of the Moat or Fowler family, and an older authoritative male apparition who is often seen in common rooms smoking a pipe. Occasionally, the smell of tobacco lingers after he is gone. Multiple paranormal investigation teams have also visited the Lumber Baron Inn, including the team from Spirit Paranormal and the cast of the TV show Ghost Detectives. Between two separate investigations, one in 2011 and the other in 2012, Spirit Paranormal claimed to have captured the full name of the person who murdered Noach and Weaver, though they haven't released that name publicly. Another unbelievable night at the Lumber Baron Inn last night, folks. They, read on, they wrote on Facebook in 20, October 2012. This is an old article, by the way, guys. According to hauntedhouses.com, if I was not there to see this in person, I would not have believed it. For the second straight year, we received the same name of the killer from the unsolved 1970 double murder of the ITC spirit box device. Well, then release the name! It's unlikely this alleged evidence would be admissible in court of law, of course, but the numerous investigations at the Lumber Baron Inn do attest to the one confirmed horror that looms over the otherwise quaint bed and breakfast in Denver, Colorado. The unsolved murders of Kara Noach and Mary Ann Weaver. Guys, what do you think of the Lumber Baron Inn? And would you go there? Because it is a bed and breakfast. I think it's still a bed and breakfast now. Let's see. I'm looking it up, guys. Give me a second. Heather, whatever goes sad. It is, and you could stay there. So would you guys... Lisa Bugo's I Would Go story is so sad. Wendy would go, I would go with you, Lisa. It is an awesome looking house. I would definitely want to stay there. Ooh, they have afternoon tea. And they give you the rules. <laughs> Out of curiosity, how, how much is it is to stay here? You know me. Our historic Denver B&B provides a variety of amenities and experiences for your stay. All rooms feature upscale antiques, high-speed Wi-Fi, private jacuzzi baths, HD TV, and updated modern showers. Each room has a unique ceiling design by Bradbury and Bradbury and amazing comfortable antique beds. Because of the age of the mansion, we do not have an elevator. All guest rooms are located on the second floor and the grand ballroom is located on the third on the two third floor. They need to proofread. Please note that due to this, we are not always able to facilitate, facilitate, facilitate handicapped guests fully. No children under eight. Ooh. 
Oh, I guess they have different sweets. The honeymoon sweet. The garden sweet. The Valentine sweet. The anniversary sweet. The Colorado room. Okay, I bite. I'm going to go to the Valentine suite. I don't know why. <laughs> because of the ungodly purple. Actually, you know what? That's not that bad. The walls. It looks like it's 250 a night. And they're kind of booked. That's kind of cool. D Dice goes, it's Barney colored walls. It is. It's not that bad, though. I wonder if all. If, um. If all the rooms are the same price. Oh no, the um the honeymoon suite is two fifty no, I think it is the same price, two fifty nine. The honeymoon suite. Thank you, Gunner Girl. Chris Barber goes, I smell my great-grandmother's perfume many times. Ooh. Hold on, guys. I'm looking at all the different suites. <laughs> I just like how it goes, no children under eight, please. Oh, no. The garden suite is 249. So I guess yeah, there are different prices. But why is the bathroom different in these? Complimentary hot Scottish breakfast prepared by our in-house executive chef and served in the dining parlors. In room coffee service for 10 9.99. This includes a personal pot of coffee for two with cream and sugar delivered to your door at the time that fits best for you. I mean, the rooms all look cool. I'm just li I'm looking at the different suites, real guys. Give me a second. Oh, the anniversary suite's like two twenty nine. <laughs> FYI for anybody that wants to stay at the Lumber Baron Inn in Colorado, Denver, Colorado. I mean, it's a nice place. It's kind of a steep price, but I guess it has its, it is a, uh, an old vintage hotel. So you do get a, like, it's a vintage modernized bed and breakfast. So you probably, you probably have a nice stay there. Be cool to go to. All right, guys, I, the, my next article came out. Okay, now I saw it because when I first saw it, I didn't see the date. came out March 12th. It's from The Guardian. A little bit of UFO here. It looks like a UFO. Hiker, dis hiker discovers mysterious silver monolith in Powies? Powies. Powies. 
Discovery follows spat of monoliths around the world in 2020, which conspiracy conspiracy theorists speculated could have been the work of aliens. When Craig Muir spotted an object while hiking the summit of the of a hill, he thought he was having a close encounter of the third kind. However, while apparently not a UFO, the shiny silver monolith in a muddy patch of Poway's uplands was strikingly mysterious. When I first saw it, I was a bit taken back as it looked like some sort of UFO, said Muir. A builder who lives in Hayon Wee nearby. It seems like, oh my gosh, Muir, a builder who lives in Hayon Wee nearby. It seemed like a very fine metallic material, almost like a surgical steel. The steel structure was almost 10 feet long and looked perfectly leveled and steady despite the weather being windy. Following a spat of monoliths appearing around the world in 2020 in the Isle of Wight, Romania, and the Utah desert, conspiracy theorists speculated that aliens could be behind the structures. Since there is no way to drive up to the top of the Hay Bluff Hill, Mir suggested, it could have been taken by a group of people or dropped off by the helicopter on its spot. It didn't seem like it was chucked in there. Instead, it has been accurately put in the ground, he told PA Media. However, there were no obvious tracks around it, and one would think that there would be a lot of, of mess around it, but there wasn't. No one has yet come forward to claim responsibility of the Welsh monolith, which bears a resemblance to the one that fe that's featured in Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001 a space odyssey the latest monolith a large upright structure usually made of stone is similar to one found on compton beach on the isle of Wight four years ago which was also described as being around 10 feet tall the first monolith reported in utah was originally spotted by state wildlife officials who were helping to count bighorn sheep from a helicopter the 10 to 12 foot structure was discovered in the ground tucked into a red Rock Cove and was subsequently removed by the Utah Bureau of Land Management. An anonymous collective called the Most Famous Artists took credit for the structures in the U.S. in 2020. Guys, what do you think this monolith is? I mean, I kind of heard about it. And I actually thought it was an art, old article because I had heard about the monolith in Utah, but it's actually a, a newer one. Pekka, how's it going? Leonard talking, speaking of um, the Lumber Baron Inn, I would spend it at would spend the night at the Stanley and spend it there at the the Lumber Baron Inn if even nothing happened. I would too, because it's a nice hotel. Matthew goes someone's art project. I think, it, yeah, I agree with you, Matthew. I think it's someone just um, placing these monoliths, probably someone with money, because the I guess the location it's in, there's no way to drive it up there. You have to kind of hike, so it has to be someone with money and probably a helicopter that does it. But I don't think it's UFO related. I don't think an alien dropped it. But it does. They do look like the monoliths from the, the 2001 movie. Kyle goes viral marketing for something yet unseen. Yes, it could be. Could be.
Someone that just wants attention and make a statement? Leonardo goes, we shall see. True. Heather, whatever goes, not UFO made from old tinfoil hats. Just kidding. <laughs> he had an encounter. A close encounter of the third kind. Dun, dun, dun. All right. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to open it up for questions and answers. Invisible Rose, how's it going? Kyle goes, just like the creepy smile people is viral marketing for the smile movie. I have yet to finish that movie. And I know a second one's coming out because I just, the concept is awesome. Like I found the fan film of Smile. Or, or the film that Smile is based on. It's a fam film. I felt like that was better than the actual movie. And I've never, I never went back to finish it. Leonarco's another wannabe Beyonce breaks the internet. <laughs> I know she has a, a, a country hit now. <laughs> D Nice put a question on Telegram. She's she took a picture of Skella Goose and she goes, Why does it look like he's he's pooing light? It does. I didn't think of that. <laughs> yeah, they were like, Beyonce shows up on the country charts, and I was like, What? It's like Beyonce came out with the house track. I was I was always like, that's a wannabe house track. She doesn't know what real house is. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to say that because that's how I felt about it. I agree, Chris Barber. Beyonce is not country. Tyrana goes, great stories, Lisa. Thank you. You're welcome, Tyrana. Glad you enjoyed them. Invisible Rose goes, it's part of her evil plot to take over the world. She's like this. <laughs> Invisible Rose, I think she is from Texas, if I'm not mistaken. Beyonce. I think she is. She was born in Houston, Texas. So, yeah. But still, though, I feel like she's not country. <laughs> I agree, D-Nice. Yes, she's from Texas, but she's pop. She, yeah. I don't, I consider her pop. I don't consider her any other genre. She could try to reinvent herself, but. I mean, I give her that, like, she's she's diving into different genres, which is cool, but I don't consider her a country artist. Invisible Rose, Taylor Swift, uh, yeah, Taylor Swift did. That, I actually liked Taylor Swift as a country artist, and then when she went pop, I, I kind of was like, what? But I get it, you're going to go where the money is, I, I get it. I understand. Like, you gotta brighten your horizon. But. <laughs> Whitney goes, if you deny your roots, don't come back. <laughs> Tyrana agrees, not country. Heather, whatever goes crossover, sometimes don't cut it. I agree. They don't. I mean, if I, I mean, she's going to have her fans follow her wherever she goes, but 
Leonora goes, Beyonce will never beat MJ. I don't think anybody's going to beat MJ, to be honest with you. <laughs> D-Dice goes, just because you say Texas in a song, don't make it country true. I, I, I heard it. It's catchy. It's, I mean, if you hear it enough times, because that's what people like, people like what they hear and what they know. So if you hear it on the radio, I'm like, oh my God, this is the best music ever. But it's catchy. Cause I saw, I, um, I just, I was scroll scrolling and I saw, um, this guy was doing like a step workout to the Texan hold, hold em song. And they were like bouncing around, going up and down the step. And I was like, dang, that looks fun. <laughs> like a good work, like a fun workout. Invisible Rose, truth be told, I'm not a Beyonce fan, but I dig her country sounds. Nothing wrong with that, Invisible Rose. Invisible goes its country if it talks about trucks, beer, and girls. I'm, I'm going to have to say yes, Invisible Rose. <laughs> Wendy's like, sheesh. <laughs> Chris doesn't listen to pop or country. I uh, My dad used to listen to oldies and in country. So I kind of have my country, as I call it, country roots, country music roots. So I do, um, I like a little country. Toby Keith, rest in peace, was one of my favorite country singers. So it was sad for me uh, when he passed. Because he, he also had the same cancer my mom had. So it was like, whoa. <laughs> D-Dice goes last. Let's remember that country music was sung by people of color in the beginning. I can bring out my rock history book I have from when we had the debate about Nirvana. Matthew goes, you could call Johnny Cash gangster country. Yeah, go for it, D-Nice. I love um, history. I, I love music, so history of music is no different. It's one of my other passions. So it's kind of cool seeing Post Malone sing a Toby Keith song. And he, he, he took a drink. Invisible Rose, my four-year-old, loves Johnny Cash. Oh, that's so cool. D-Nice quit trying to summon the Lewis. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he'll say anything about country. <laughs> Yeah, I listened to Toby Keith, Alan Jackson. Um, those are the two I remember I would listen to a lot. That Chris Barber, I kind of listened to like the country in 90s country, I guess. 90s and 2000s. <laughs> the newer stuff I don't listen to as much. Matthew goes, Lewis is a girl band. Guys, keep those questions coming. And if you're new and trickling by, feel free to say hi. We do not bite. As long as you're polite, we do not bite. F 
Feel free to say hi if you're coming by, scrolling through. Are you? We usually talk all things spooky here, but I'm at toward. I always open it up to questions and answers at the end. Chris, it goes. I'm talking like Loretta Lynn era. She was. She was like a legend, Loretta Lynn. As long as you guys are polite, everyone's welcome. Feel free to say hi, because I know sometimes if I see people live, I don't say hi, but I'm there. I'm like I'm a lurker, so if you guys are lurking around, feel free to say hi. Wendy goes, I know I was raised as a North Neck. I didn't know how to explain it until I moved to Tennessee. Called a half back in North Carolina. I didn't mean the labels. D-Nice is like, I think I see the pinch a duck. Invisible Rose, I lurk on again. I lurk. I'm like a lurker, but I'll come in and I'll say hi. Oh my god, there was this YouTuber. And she comes up on my feed every once in a while. Um, I guess she 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 does videos about haunted TikToks. And she's kind of annoying, to be honest with you. I don't know. I don't remember her name. I try not to remember her name. But she was live yesterday. So I decided... And I don't like talking about other YouTubers because I don't care, you know, what they're doing. Um, I kind of just like... I just look to see what they do just to see what they talk about. Um, but she has a message pinned up on her live chat, right? And I'm cool. I don't mind. Everyone's welcome. As long as you don't, or as long as you guys are polite and don't cause drama, like whatever, right? Which we don't. We're pretty, we're a pretty cool bunch here. Um, we're kind of like big family. We hang out, we talk, we laugh. Um, but right on the pin, I decided to click on it and go, what did she say? She's like. She's like, don't ask for a shout out. I was like, what? And I was like, you know what? Never mind. I don't want to watch her live. <laughs> she was like, the just how she said it. She said like, don't ask for, like, number one, don't ask for a shout out. Number two, don't do this. Number three, don't do this. And I was like, what? Uh, no, I don't think so. So then I clicked out of her. <laughs> I don't even remember her name. I just happened to um scroll by and she happened. Yeah, Lisa Boo. That's how how I felt. Wow, that's rude. That's how I felt. I was like, dude, you have she had like 1.2 million subscribers. All right. She's pretty big in YouTube land. And um, I don't remember her name because I don't really I don't follow her. She just happened to pop up. And I was like, what? And you're saying number one, no shout outs. It's like, okay. <laughs> D-Nice goes, don't blink, don't eat or sleep, don't even breathe. That's how I felt when I was reading it, D-Nice. Leonor goes, FTP, my nice way. So I was like, dude, like, really? I get it. You're probably sponsored or what it might be or whatnot. Like some of these other YouTubers are, but still, dude, or do debt. <laughs> I kind of was like, oh my gosh. It, it, it was weird, Heather, whatever. I was like, nope, I'm out of here. Tyranna goes, that's so weird. I know I am, but I just wanted to mention it because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I could not believe what I was seeing. You might have come across her. I just don't remember her name because I don't follow her. Heather, whatever goes repeat after me as if. I just felt like that was, yeah. It 
It just was. Yeah. All right. Anyways, guys, keep the questions going. <laughs> Wendy goes, bitches could be so ultra catty. <laughs> that I that's how I felt like just reading that. Like, what are you trying? You, you're already putting the 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 part of my French, the bitch vibe. And I'm just barely coming into your chat. Like, forget this. I could go elsewhere. I don't need this. <laughs> Heather, whatever goes, it was Megan Merkel in disguise just saying. Leonore goes, never again. Exactly. Never again. And exactly. Wendy Marino saying, not worth your energy, Lisa. It isn't. I agree. I know it is still occupying brain space, Wendy. <laughs> but I just wanted to share because I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Pekka goes, I love trance, hard trance, hard drum and bass, chill out, nightcore, power metal, symphonic metal, doom metal, etc., etc. For example, for a few genres. Wow, Pekka, you have like a, a awesome... Who's your favorite, uh, Pekka? Who's your favorite trance DJ? Guys, keep the questions going. Oh, no way. Pekka Saint Giuseppe out of. Adiviani. I got to see him at EDC last year. He's one of my favorites too. That's cool, Pekka. D Nice goes, when will we hear you, DJ <laughs> Grey Wolf? Um, as Lewis said, I was I, um he didn't pay me enough to go on the last time. I was laughing. Uh whenever whenever we stream again, I'll try to make it uh uh, I'll try to make it on. Julius is asking, how am I enjoying my time off? I am enjoying it. I am really enjoying it. Um, I'm doing things that I was getting frustrated that I couldn't do. And I'm, I'm trying to get it. Uh, I'm getting it done. There's still things on my list that I haven't gotten done, but, uh, invisible Rose going to EDC this year. I think we are going to EDC this year. As well. And I'm hoping to catch. Uh, a few of my favorite DJs. That I have missed. But I am enjoying my time off. Do not want to go back to retail. I'm trying to think of a plan B because I'm probably have to have a plan B. But I do not want to go back to retail. That's my main thing. Leonardo, go see you in Arizona. Yes, we will be at Mad Monster Party in Arizona in July as well. We go every year. I cannot wait. Um, I always have a blast when I go. D nice goes, do you prefer front of the crowd, middle, or back? Well, if it's like one of my favorite DJs, I want to be up front because I, I want to see, I want to see them go, what's up, EDC? Are you guys having a good time? <laughs> I, I want to see a mix and everything, but if it's just listening, I'd rather be in the um the back. Because Seriously, if you're like in the middle, you'll get people just going in front of you and you can't see. D nice is asking, do I crowd surf? No, I do not. <laughs> I almost got bombarded in a, a mosh, mosh pit when I was younger, but no. 
D nice is asking, have you ever lost a shoe? No, I have not. <laughs> Thank goodness. And I wear Crocs when I go. Yes, I walk all around the fest. I, I wore Crocs to EDC. I walked around EDC with my Crocs on. D nice, what do you eat over there? What we tend to do because the prices are extreme. Well, I mean, EDC, you're kind of, we camp there, so we kind of stuck eating what they have there but if it's uh one that we're going to uh we kind of eat before because the price is ridiculously ridiculous <laughs> i mean they do offer plant-based options there but it's like you get three tacos for like 30 bucks i'm not kidding you and it's like it doesn't even come with chips not including drink. That's just, I mean, what was it? Like 18 bucks, I think. So you end up spending 100 bucks and you're still hungry. <laughs> yes, D-Nice is asking, do you carry sanitizer? Yes, you have to. Because sometimes, I am not kidding you, they have um, the porta-potties. I mean, if you go in the VIP area... They do have the nicer ones where they flush, like the portable restrooms, but they flush and they have air conditioning and water so you can wash your hands. But if it's just a porta potty one, sometimes the ding in porta potties, the little porta sinks, they don't have water. And I'm like, dude, this is like a way that no wonder people get you, you could get sick doing this. So, yeah, I started bringing sanitizer, like, it's a must. Pekka goes, who needs food when having so much fun? Yes, because when you're there, you just want to walk around and see every stage possible. <laughs> D-Nice goes, um, do you have a camelback or are they even allowed? I do have, um, you can bring, I do have something like a camelback, uh, but it's for, uh, it's specifically for festivals. It's like an anti-theft one. Um, it's called the Lunchbox. I don't know if you guys have heard that brand, but it's a hydro pack um that that's like with anti-theft features because you do get you do get pickpocketed unfortunately at these festivals so i do have one and that's what i bring in and that's where i put my wipes and my my i have my spray sanitizer i've got the wipes uh tissues like stuff gum D nice goes just have an MRE. Yeah, like especially because I don't want to use the restrooms there. I literally try not to use the restrooms. Because also, too, if you go early, that's when I tend like that's when we tend to go. We go early, there's not a big crowd. So I'm like, okay, let's go to the restroom before the crowd comes. But after that, you you don't want to you do not want to look for a restroom because of the crowds. It's like ridiculous. Oh, Leonora, trust me, uh, be be always aware of dehydration, being thirsty is a sign of dehydration. I always make sure we're hydrated. Pekka goes, Lewis got you on his back, right? I mean, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> D nice goes, do you have a neck fan or portal fan? I do, but I don't. I guess we could bring them in, but I've never brought it in, so I don't want it. I think you can bring those in. I'm not sure. I've seen people with like the portable fans. So I guess you can. But that was in camp. I don't know if you could bring it in the festival. That's kind of the first place I go to is the 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 water stations. Holy crap, people. Thank you, Heather Whatever, for your PayPal. Hearts for Heather Whatever. Heather Whatever, you're awesome. You're super awesome, Heather Whatever.
Actually, Leonora, I don't have a clear bag. They let me in with my um. I just open. It's like a pain though, but I just open all the the uh, compartments. Like I'm already there, and it's already open. Like I got nothing to hide. But keep the questions going, guys. Leonor, thank you for the super sticker of the cute corgi hearts for Leonor. Thanks again, Leonor. You're awesome as well. You're all awesome. What am I talking about? <laughs> hearts for Leonor and Heather, whatever, guys. Keep the questions coming, guys. We'll have a little hangout after my topics. D nice goes mine and my man's anniversary was the first time in a long time I went to Disneyland and I thought see through bags were needed security appreciated but my back was not big enough for H2 <laughs> Nah, I filled my hydro pack with water and I was like holy crap this thing's heavy like after a while it was starting my shoulder was starting to hurt Leonor, Lisa with the crazy stories, how many of them do you believe? Um, depending on what it is, but I'm, I'm always going to be a little skeptical with them. It's always good to be a little skeptical. Um, unless I actually experience it myself. I don't dismiss that places are haunted or anything like that or, or, like the one article we read about the Texas high school, El Paso high school. I, I feel like what they are saying is plausible because like I said, there were dead bodies stored there. Uh, like the article said as well, there was dead bodies stored there during world war two. So I believe that something could happen out of that. So I, I'm still, I'll still have a little bit of skepticism, but I can feel like some of the stories are plus there's some that it's obvious that it, it isn't haunted or it's fake or it's made up. But, um, but especially the TikTok videos, those I'm, I'm always going to be skeptical about. I'm always going to be skeptical about those. They're fun to watch though. I give the people great. Um, I give the people props for their editing and everything. They're cool to watch. Not to say it's kind of sad for the person that is filming something that's real and people are going to be like, no, this is fake. So I kind of feel bad for those people, but I, I like, especially with TikTok, I'm going to be super skeptical. Carol goes, I fill mine about a third of the way and freeze it, then fill with water so it stays cold. I have two of them, one small and one little larger. Cool. Tyranna goes, what all have you been able to do now that you're off? Um, I'm able to stream more. <laughs> um, probably, uh, uh, I know it's going to sound cliche, but I'm able to hike and work out. I wasn't able to do 
that when I was working. So I was getting frustrated because I would go to work and I'd come back and I'd be exhausted. Like it would literally, I'd be so exhausted that as soon as I sat down, I would knock out. Um, so I've been doing that. Uh, I've been getting sleep. I know this is because I would not, I could not, I did not get sleep at all. I always had trouble sleeping. So now I'm, I'm sleeping. Uh, I don't have the problem because I'm not running around like a chicken without its head anymore. So, or I don't have that stress or, uh, so I'm able to sleep better. There's some other things I want to do that I haven't gotten to. Like I want to go to places, but our weather is being crazy right now. So, but D nice is asking how much room, how much more room do you have back there room for more Funkos or dolls? Uh, I can make room. <laughs> the stuff, I, I mean, I take sleep very seriously. So now that I'm able to sleep, I, I feel better. There, I think there's still times where I kind of don't feel that great, but uh, for the most part, I'm feeling better. Julissa goes, I'm glad you're able to prioritize yourself. Yes, that was the plan because I needed to, it just, where I was at was there was nothing left for me there, to be honest with you, because I had no intentions of moving up because it wasn't what I wanted. And I pretty much had learned everything I possibly could in the position I was in. So it was like, I was really, there was no, I wasn't advancing or learning and, and it was just, it was kind of getting, it was just, I was there and I was dragging my feet and it was to the point where I just, it, it, it was something I needed to do for myself. D nice goes, you better make room when I have time to give your gift. I will D nice. Do not worry. Matthew goes, Lewis needs to haunted hike with you. Yes, he does. I need to do that. But I'm waiting for the ding and weather to die, to clear up. <laughs> We're supposed to get rain again. Like I wanted to go hiking um, today, but then I was like, oh, it's going to be muddy. Or I'd be so tired. I couldn't even watch TV like, and I would get frustrated by that. Cause I was like, dude, it's my day off. I want to sit down and watch the program. I've been wanting to watch all week and I end up falling asleep while I'm watching it. And I needed to do that just for my mind to clear. I don't know if I can permanently go without going back to a nine to five, but we'll try, but it's wherever the waves will take me. Leonardo's weather chose your mind. Yes. I, well, I did go for a walk though. I still went out, but it was, it was a, a, a city hike. There you go. It was on cement. <laughs> D nice goes, do you believe in chemtrails? I thought it was a weird concept, but with this weather, I think so. Um, I do. I do believe in them. I do. I've seen them and, and I do believe that they're plausible. I do. Leonora goes, find your peace. Yep, that's what I had to do. But guys, keep the questions going. Probably stay on for a few more minutes. D nice goes, I want to go back to the Brea trails biking. There was so much fun. I got to walk that and I had so much fun. I want to go back too. there's some I want to go back to. 
Kyle goes, any downtime is better than no downtime. True. Matthew goes, had tons of rain in Florida, too. I know they had a, a music festival out in Miami, and they had to cancel one of the days because of weather. So it's the same. <laughs> We're having some crazy weather. Heather Whatever goes, lots of snow. I saw, I saw, I think it was a, a meme uh, of Punxsutawney Phil, and someone said he lied. <laughs> I guess because we were supposed to have a short winter and we're still getting all this rain. <laughs> and I just started laughing. I thought it was hilarious. I was like, what did he do to you? Come on. It's punks of, punks of Tony Phil. <laughs> he probably needs glasses at this point. <laughs> he thought he saw his shadow. <laughs> All right, guys, keep the questions going. We do not bite. <clears throat> D-Nice goes, the movie theater parking is where I would do my workouts, then bike to the baseball field. I miss being that active. My eye is still not... Stable, so equilibrium is off. I have to be, it, it sounds weird, like I have to be active because um, it calms down my anxiety. So it's kind of something I have, to, It I always feel better after I exercise, like it calms my nerves. So it's something, I. it's not like I have to do it, I enjoy it too. Tyrana is asking, did anyone else see the TV show La Brea? It's pretty good. No, I haven't, Tyrana. So if I'm not, I, like, even when I'm sick, it's hard for me not to be active. So, Le Leonore, I know how you feel. <laughs> It's hard for me to, to, even when I'm hurt or if I'm sick, it's hard for me to like, just slow down and, you know, rest. I'll be sick and the next day I'll go on a walk. Like that's, that's how I am. I'm crazy. D nice goes, I need a roar rover. Bumping into things is no fun, so stationary machine workouts are what I can do now. Oh, a row those are fun. I haven't done one of those in a, a while. Leonardo goes, don't say that right now. I'm not allowed. <laughs> Oh my God. When I had, when I got really sick, I get, I get the cabin fever and I, I just, I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to go outside. I got to do something. Heather, whatever goes me too. around the same day as my first big C shot. I regretted it. Even with that, when I had the big C, oh. I mean, I waited for the quarantine period, and then as soon as that was up, I was like, I'm out the door. I'm going to walk. I'm going to go out and walk. I was dying. I mean, I was sick, too. Really sick. So I had to the first time I got it.
T Nice goes, All I have are my resistance band. It's okay, and I'm in a groove until someone knocks on my door. Leave me alone. Oh, I hate that when I'm in the middle of the workout. I'm like, I'm working out. Leave me alone. <laughs> Pekka goes, if it's lightning and rain, I want to just run I want to just run naked until it stops, so keep the flash on yourself. I know I'm always hiking and walking and I see people walking their dogs. I'm like, oh I miss having a dog sometimes. All right, guys, any last minute questions before I end this stream? Any last minute questions? Oh, D Nice is asking, where is the pinche duck? Um, it's literally right above this ear on my headphones. It's literally right above it. Like if you could see like a little bit of the like right there where my finger's pointing. That's where he is. He's actually he's sitting on top of my mini arcade. That I have right there that you can't tell is a mini arcade. Julissa goes, you could borrow my dog. <laughs> Carol goes, during the quarantine, I still got to go out because I was my dad's driver for dialysis. I worked in retail, so I was out in it. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, anything out of the ordinary. Like I wasn't really quarantined. It is the tail of the duck kind of. <laughs> I know, D nice. I'm just trying this out because I kind of it kind of brightens my horizon. So it's something new. But I appreciate y'all for dropping by while I'm trying this weird format. All right, guys, I am going to end the stream. Thank you for joining me as we talked about crazy things happening in the spooky world. I'll see you on the next one. Stay spooky, sweet nightmares, and new good night, guys. And thank you again. You guys are awesome. Good night. <laughs>